Good afternoon. It's 101 Eastern. That means it's time for Vision, a show about the trends, ideas, and disruptions changing the face of our democracy. Press freedom and freedom of expression in the face of government interference are bedrock principles of American democracy, yet they are liberties that are tested over and over again. Historically, many of the challenges to freedom of the press and freedom of speech emerge from state concerns over domestic and national security, and those sorts of challenges and frictions are unlikely to abate. Yet, as we've been discussing recently on Vision, threats to liberty come from new sources in a time of intense technological and social change. Some of these threats stem from the complexities and ambiguities associated with information that is sometimes digitally collected and distributed. And some stem from the ambiguities around our own views about what constitutes journalistic objectivity and integrity, or what constitutes openness and civility in an era in which all of these qualities are being criticized as potential masks for exclusion, oppression, and discrimination. That is, we find ourselves in a moment in which we are questioning the limits of the empire of liberty and the possibility of friction with other ideas we hold about what constitutes a just society. Sitting at the intersection of these challenges is Nabiha Syed. She's the president of The Markup, a nonprofit uh, data-driven investigative journalism publication, illuminating how powerful institutions use technology to reshape society. She was also previously vice president and general counsel of BuzzFeed and is a highly regarded First Amendment lawyer. So please join me in welcoming to the show, Nabiha. Hello, Hi, how, are how are you? Good, good. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you today. No, thank you. Thanks for coming. We really appreciate it. I, uh, I, I want to start with, um, with your experience uh, as, uh, as an attorney uh, and a legal thinker in the context of journalism. Um, because I sort of think about, uh, you know, our, our touchstone for thinking about freedom of the press is, you know, we saw the post. And so we were sort of imagining, you know, Meryl Streep and, and Tom Hanks um, and their and the kind of high minded mid 20th century views of of what a newspaper is supposed to do. And you really cut your teeth as a First Amendment lawyer working at BuzzFeed, which sort of epitomizes, you know, the the polar opposite of that. It's run by tech oriented startup uh, oriented thinkers it w from the beginning was blending different kinds of content some of which was traditionally journalistic some of which you know famously is lists sort of the iconic form of of internet uh, of internet writing and content and so just tell us like help help us understand when what how press freedom issues in particular are just different today um, than, than, in, than in the moments that a lot of us use to, as a frame of reference. Oh, totally. They're so different, right? And they're different in two ways. Um, in the, in the post-era in the 1970s versus now, they're different because of cash and they're different because of courts, right? So the cash situation for media organizations in the 1970s looked real different than the like precipice of media extinction events that we're seeing now. And the cash thing matters in two ways, right? It matters because if you have a Russian oligarch sue you now, as we did at BuzzFeed, a series of them, um, in, you know, in the 1970s, you might have uh, a, just tons of lawyers, tons of resources to go fight that fight. For us at BuzzFeed, we did fight that fight, but it was a, a consider, it was a hard choice, right? To be like, do you have, to defend one of those big litigations is not straightforward and it is not cheap. Um, not for us at BuzzFeed and, and not for us at The Markup, but overall in the industry, we're also seeing that like, there's not necessarily enough cash to, to report on everything that needs to be reported on, including those hard hitting stories that could lead to you know, people being mad and suing you. So the cash thing matters. The courts piece, I use the plural because it's both the court of law and the court of, a, of public opinion, right? In the post's time in the 1970s, if you, um, did something risky like they did in publishing the Pentagon Papers, you might be able to bank on the court doing the right thing and saying, you know, justice is served. There goes my Air AirPod. Um, you also might be able to trust that the court of public opinion would be behind you, like believe that you're acting in the public interest. And today we can't make either of those bets, right? We don't know that the court's actually going to endorse what reporters are doing. It's very politicized and that reflects itself in the court of public opinion as well. And so we're just navigating a much more fractured um, terrain than we were 50 years ago. But so let me sort of push you on a couple of those. I mean, so on the on the cash side, I mean, how should that make us feel about the future of press freedom, right? Because, you know, me, if, if you're telling 
me that needs are increasing. It strikes me that means are diminishing. I mean, even, even in a BuzzFeed model, there's a different kind of financial pressure than there might have been on a, on a Washington Post in that era uh, in terms of where, where cash was going within the business. So are we, where does, where, on, the, on the cash dimension, are you an optimist or a pessimist about our, our ability to defend uh, an, an idea of a free press? I'm an optimist, but that's because optimism is my biggest flaw. I think that there are a number of very smart people trying to work on at least the defending journalism front, right? So we have now a network of media clinics across the country. I mean, a couple of fellow law students started one of the first ones just over a decade ago. Um, and you have very smart lawyers volunteering their time and their wits to say, how do we defend against these threats, right? So on the just defense portion, I think, we're gonna find creative solutions to do that. So long as there are lawyers and like, I mean, there's always lawyers. On the actually generating those kinds of stories um, that lead to maybe those tensions or things that, you know, poke at the powerful enough to precipitate some sort of court response, that's where I worry, right? Like, really? do we have enough reporters? Do we, are we giving them the resources not to just be stenographers of what's happening, you know, like president, the president tweeted X, I saw this, but really like the deep investigative work, I can tell you like now, you know, being the president of the market for the past few months, it's slow, it's painstaking and it's expensive work to do deep investigative journalism. And that's the piece where I think there's a lot of urgency in figuring out the business model. And then on the, on the, on the political side, you know, I guess it strikes me as in any area of jurisprudence where there's a sort of social resonance, sometimes courts are ahead you know, of where people are and sometimes courts are right in line and sometimes courts are behind, uh, you know, where, where society is. I mean, is it necessarily true today that, that you can't, is there something different about either the way the public thinks about press freedom today or the kinds of issues that are being reported on that gives you less optimism that, um, that, that, the, that the courts can rely on will be affirmed by um, or institutions, journalism institutions will be affirmed by the court of public opinion ultimately? Yeah, like if you look at the, just going back to the post era, right, you're at this time where there's something in the water of the idea of the journalist acting on behalf of the public, right? This idea of the clear public interest. Yeah. We are the ones, the reporters are the ones who are chasing down corruption. They're the ones who are like uncovering every stone to tell you what's going on. The next, like the nexus between the journalist and the public and like that sort of fiduciary obligation or the trust given in the reporter yeah. to act on their behalf gives you a lot of leeway, right? Gives you a lot of support. Um, that the courts are also responsive to and maybe endorse. Now, I just don't think we can assume that because you know a, a lot of the public in the United States doesn't necessarily see the press acting on their behalf. And even for the folks who do, they think that for some angle of the press, but not necessarily someone across the aisle, it's not the press as a whole, it is much more fractured. Yeah, well, and this, right, is a really, because we'll talk a bit about just sort of freedom of expression generally. I mean, this feels to me like a really critical distinction between press freedom and freedom of speech. I mean, press freedom is a socially mm -hmm. mediated freedom. You know, it's Absolutely. a, it, you have to, yeah, I think you make a great point. You're, if you trust the institution to do its job, then the thing that's being defended is the ability for the institution to do its job. Uh, and you can, you can internally, yeah. you can, re, individuals can resort to that and say, I didn't like the story, but this is why a newspaper exists. And if you don't, if you're sort of questioning why the institution exists, or even, you know, we're going to be putting out some polling soon uh, that we've done with Gallup, where, you know, like one in 10 Republicans say the media is out to ruin the country. You know, if you, if you think this institution is trying to ruin wow. the country, you have the contrary view, right, that you want to rein in, Absolutely. you want to rein in that institution. How, what do we do about that? I mean, what did, what, how did you, did you talk about this actively at BuzzFeed, the sort of social support dimension to, to the popularity dimension, the trust dimension to what you were doing and the boundaries you were pushing? Yeah, I think most newsrooms I know of are having some version of this conversation, right? And it, it pops up when, uh, when you talk about audience engagement. Um, it, for us at The Markup Now, it pops up a lot when we t talk about um, how we bring people into the work that we do. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what reporters do when you see someone like the president reflecting this all the time. Oh, they just make it up. Oh, they no. just call two sources and they just say something. And the, there is some fair critique of journalism there where you do have these like three makes a trend anecdotal stories that reflect a very particular like sliver of society and aren't more comprehensive. And that's one reason why at the markup, we're like, okay, we're going to do this data-driven 
reporting and recognize that even in that in any analysis of any time or any exercise of editorial discretion there may be either bias or a particular perspective that's reflected and that's okay we can accept that we disclose everything that we do we we call it show your work we disclose our data set we are like here's links to all the cases that we looked at here's what it is and you can take a look and if you choose to disagree that's all right we're going to equip you to challenge what we're doing and also bring you in into just how um, intensive the analysis was. And I think that's part of helping rehabilitate the image of the reporter of like, this isn't just a like, yeah, I found a, found a tweet somewhere, wrote it down. Yeah. It's, it's much more than that. But do you, I mean, so I just to push on that though, cause, cause I, think, um, I think those are great performative gestures. On the yeah. other hand, again, right, the reason the institution is trusted, if it's trusted, is like, I don't have to do the work. Like, I believe in the method behind, I believe there is a method, you know, behind the work that separates information from knowledge, you know, and that yeah. that's the work that this institution is doing. And, and it strikes me in sort of, the, it seems to me there's sort of a consistent theme in polling, right, which is that people on both sides, sort of on all ideological views, see the media as a bit more of a participant in the ideological wars than an observer, mm -hmm. than a reporter. And I think media organizations, effective ones, ones that have resources, are definitely doing what you're saying. They're sort of showing their work mm -hmm. more, they're explaining how they got the story, they're explaining why the story is important. But it's sort of like the solution and the, the, the vector of distrust don't exactly line up. Like, is yeah. there a way out of this spiral we're in where people, people just assume that, you know, that, that the markup will have a side or the Washington Post or the New York Times will have a side and, and no matter what, that's gonna be animating how they report a story. Um, I think there is a way for, I wanna say two things about that. The first is that the trust building is slow, right? So yes, yeah. it's true that the organizations are doing this now and it's not gonna bear fruit in one year or maybe even a decade. This is a much longer project um, and we have a, a far way to go. I also think that there's a really interesting shift that's happening where um, we used to think of these big institutions, we trusted them to be our gatekeepers, right? We trust them to be these big gatekeepers, like they would climb to the top of the mountain, survey everything, come back and tell you what it was, and you just trusted them for it. And I think what we're seeing in part because of social media and what it allows and its affordances, um, and also maybe a, a function of, of the fracture of this moment, is that we're switching to the idea of, of journalists as guides, right? Like you trust uh -huh. a particular person. These are individuals who you trust. You actually know their viewpoints. They share it with you yeah. and you can moderate the information you're receiving through that lens. And that familiarity, I think, does over time build trust. What it used to look like is that like you kind of knew the local reporters in your town because yep. they showed up at the school board meetings and maybe you saw them at the grocery store and there was an interpersonal dimension to this trust that fed into the institutional trust. We've seen that hollow out. So we're seeing it develop on social, like I know this person. Now that's not to say the guide model is without flaws, right? Your guide could be Tucker Carlson or Alex Jones, but it could also be Nicole Hannah Jones. It could also be Soledad O'Brien. And so the guy, you know, who the guides are matters. But I think that that's one pathway to building trust and like, and, and building it and then rolling it up into institutions, which again, yeah. will take time. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think, I mean, I think the, 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 that it's an interesting paradigm shift. I mean, I, it strikes me there's, you know, a couple additional challenges I would throw into the mix. I mean, one would be that you, I think it's absolutely right that neutrality and trust are not an inextricably linked dyad. And there mm -hmm. are a lot of that, that disclosure and commitment and loyalty also goes with trust and, uh, and transparency. So I agree with that. I do think in a climate of extreme polarization, you know, that, that, that trust will just not be available to everybody. Um, so, and that, and that maybe that's a bit more ephemeral, um, although 10 years, 10 years in to this level of polarization, I'm not sure. I, I guess the other concern though, I mean, just thinking about the two examples that you gave is that, you know, not all, not everyone is allowed to be a guide, you know, in that world now, not just based on method, but on affiliation, right? If, if what we're counterposing is Tucker Carlson and Alex Jones to Hannah Nicole Jones, but I think it's a great, I mean, that's totally fair. Um, we, are, so we are saying that there's, there, are, there are, if not ideological, moral criteria for being a guide too. And that's just feels like new terrain to me. Yeah, I think we are in new terrain in all kinds of ways in our speech environment, right? That's what's it's so fascinating to me about looking at the old paradigms of like the marketplace of ideas. We're in a moment where like the marketplace is actually the marketplace. The marketplace <laughs> 101 years ago 
uh, was a marketplace where like a couple of people could look like sellers and they didn't look like me. Right. Yeah. And, and there was a uh, presumption of civility that came when there were just a few members who knew each other and like had a lot of commonalities. Um, and there were very clear forms in which debate would happen. It would be on the pages of an op-ed page or maybe in a public debate, like, you know, like the Buckley Baldwin debates or something. And now the marketplace has a whole lot more people in it. A lot of people can sell in the marketplace and they sell some bad stuff and they sell some good stuff. And I think that this is a moment in which a lot of the agita around speech is also confronting the theory that we thought we had is actually much more expansive and accommodating and doesn't provide for us a lot of guardrails within it, right? We're like, we're all in the marketplace now, what do we do about this? And that's, that is a shift. And we're still trying to understand just what the marketplace is. We don't yet really know how Facebook works or how Twitter works. We have ideas, but it's also dynamic and changing. Um, and, and I think that's kind of the task for the future is, is figuring out exactly what the marketplace means. As a, as a first amendment attorney and scholar, I mean, do you, what, what are, what are the, you know, without f- forcing you to give sort of your grand unifying theory of, of, of the marketplace in the 21st century, what are, how do you do the work of separating out the elements of the, of the, of the marketplace of today that really are kind of expanding the domain, the, the province mm-hmm. of liberty? And the and the pathologies. Uh, some of them are, you know, feel clearer to me than others. Um, you know, outright false information versus true information. But other ones, as we know, you know, use of anonymity, um, use of invective. Um, it it, it people, everyone's scrambling for that ground. Um, whether it's more democratizing and empowering versus whether it's shutting down. How do you what what are some of your thoughts about how to separate out? as you say, the affordances of technology to expand that marketplace versus, versus the affordances of technology that hinder that, that hinder that market, that pollute that marketplace. Yeah, I think the first is to, to identify the marketplace as like, this is a theory of the First Amendment. It is about 100 years old. There's people alive today in the world who are older than this theory's introduction into our like speech universe. And that's an important Mm-hmm. context to have. Uh, and the other is that, you know, we are slowly learning about the intersections of, of psychology and behavioral science with this, um, uh, with this structure. So for, for example, um, we are learning that when someone, when there's a mass shooting or when there's death by suicide, that certain types of framing of it can create copycat uh, actions, right? that's a really new learning. Like it's only in the past, I would say five to six years that media organizations have taken that insight and been like, hmm, maybe we'll change our behavior. Or with something like mugshots that like Gannett, I think just decided that they weren't gonna post mugshots anymore. Um, What is that a realization of? It's a realization of like, oh, in posting this and injecting it into the marketplace, we are shaping social realities in a subtle way over time And that's maybe not what we want to do, even if we have the right to do it. And so I think we're in this moment in the marketplace where we're understanding how people actually work within it, because we have a real time, and this is the affordance of technology, way to experiment with that in a way that just simply wasn't visible before the internet. You you had some some ways and like, you know, microcosms in which you could have these kinds of experiments, but now we have a superstructure that shows us a, a, a lot of ways that things go sideways. And this is a real opportunity for diagnostic approach, right? And this is actually what I, separate from my like life as a First Amendment lawyer, my like, life as like a, a, a curious person who enjoys other smart people, like my life at the markup where people are like, you yeah, know, let's, uh, let's take a look under the hood through scraping or our data gathering or however our news gathering goes to understand what these platforms actually look like and how do they encourage things like amplification that have real consequences for what persuades and what doesn't. How, are, how is behavior networked in ways that we can study? What does that mean for the structure of how this is created and perhaps insights to build another structure? I think we're in this moment where we're learning very fast, but still not learning enough about what this architecture is. And that's kind of the next phase that we need to be in before we design the new theory. Like we need to diagnose first and we're just not done doing that yet. So, you know, but one of the arguments that's sometimes implicit, some lately sometimes explicit uh, that, that comes out about this is there's, I think there's, there's, there's certainly a view um, that I take out of what you just said, which is the, the internet 
digitally, digital technology, network technology in particular, is an amazing feedback loop. There, were, there are realities of interrelationships, asymmetries of power, voice out there. Our mm -hmm. narrow information news ecosystem could easily exclude them, sometimes maliciously, often as a function of the structure. Um, and now we can see them. We have a feedback loop in real time that tells us, wow, here's our myopia, and it's being exploded by the internet. And I think especially over the last couple of weeks, you have a set of people saying, it's not a feedback loop. It's basically created by the internet and it's cancel culture. And it's, you know, that sort of it's, in a, it's people exploiting an affordance of the internet to shut other people down or to hijack um, for a similarly narrow view, um, the, the, the kind of power of, of a network. How do, what, do you, what do you think about that? I mean, I'm, I'm reducing it quite a lot, obviously, but sort of how, how do you come in in that, in that discussion? Sure. I mean, here's what I will say about, I have so many things to say about cancel culture. It's one of my favorite topics, which you know. Um, I think for a lot of folks who are approaching the cancel culture situation, they are confronting actually an important function of the free speech environment called counter speech, right? And counter speech isn't necessarily neat. It's not, again, like a structured debate or like a dueling set of op-eds. It's messy. It's noisy. It's, um, it, it can be harsh at times and that is okay. There's nothing that says that counter speech has to be some sort of civilized exchange of ideas. It can and is and often will be messy as is the entire project of democracy, right? Now I have some sympathy for folks who say, oh, I live in fear that one thing I might've said once might be surfaced and it'll ruin my whole life. And I have sympathy for that because I think for generations, um, people of color in newsrooms or in a, in a variety of workplaces, people with minor, more minority views in workplaces generally have also felt the, yeah. oh no, if I but just utter one thing, I might be canceled. So my sympathy comes from a place of recognition. But I guess I would say that it shouldn't be a surprise that we have a punitive and harsh speech culture because we have a punitive and harsh society, yeah. right? We, this, we're in a society where people go to jail because they're too poor to pay bail, right? We have a society in which people are executed for mistakes they have made, sometimes atrocious mistakes, but mistakes. And so it's not shocking that the speech culture we have reflects a larger cultural dimension of, of violence and, and, a, and a punitive, punitive one. And so I guess for the folks who are kind of new to the cancel culture and very vocal about how terrible it is, I would say, that if you're now going to join us in a journey of like understanding what a forgiving society looks like or what restorative justice might yeah. look like in a society, then I would welcome your allyship. But if you're just mad because you're getting consequences for the first time in your life, then I would question the sincerity of the engagement. Um, but I do think that there, the cancel culture sort of microcosm explosion yeah. of the past few weeks carries within it all of these larger social forces that we need to start unpicking uh, and understanding too. Yeah, and I, and I think, I mean, I would agree. And, you know, I think, you know, Marianne Franks, I talked a little bit about this too, like mm -hmm. when is retribution the right justice model versus versus restoration? And by the way, sometimes retribution is the right, the right justice model <laughs> right, for right. super deviant ideas. I mean, but I, right. it doesn't mean they can't say them. It's just that, that, that to your point, the counter speech is going to be, is going to be vocal and aggressive. I, you know, also, I think, you know, one, I think one of the, one of the limitations of of the the kind of polarization that we have is that um, that it, it it everything is at stake in every debate all the time. And I there to me there's sort of two complementary challenges associated with that. One is it makes it oh it it it, it hyperbolizes issues for which not everything is at stake, and we should just mm -hmm. have some good debate. But it also flattens places where people really are, it really are putting themselves at risk in, a, in an existential way. And I think, and so it doesn't surprise me that, um, that, 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 um, that some of those who have been in power and are experiencing what they think of as cancel culture are saying, I don't like this, but they're couching it in these existential terms and people for whom, as you point out, have spent a history in which the risks are constantly existential are saying like, you know, world's smallest violin. Like, this is just not the moment <laughs> that I'm gonna stand up for you. Um, but that's not, that's a hard, that's a hard, to your point about psychology and behavior, that's, that may be morally reasonable, but it, it's a sort of an unsustainable situation. And so somehow we're going to have to figure, figure out how to elevate a lot of new voices and sort of relax a lot of people who are, you know, appropriately losing some of their, some of their stranglehold on power. Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is, it's, it's really interesting to think about like what, what are the institutions that can play that mediating role? Like one of the most heartening and fascinating things I have 
seen in other media organizations who are um, using events as part of their business model, right, is the act of convening people around ideas is actually a really um, special power and responsibility. So obviously everything is strange now because we convene over screens for the time being, but is there a future in which media organizations through their event strategies might say, hey, like we're gonna actually get people together in the same room to have these nuanced facilitated discussions about um, tough things, which, you know, in an earlier time might have been done on an op-ed op -ed page with juxtaposing yep. viewpoints of things. And that's a great forum to do it. But can you leap into the physical space to start having those conversations? And that might be a really interesting place for, for media organizations as a convener of ideas and supplier of facts and context, most critically, right, for those ideas. Like, what I love about working in media is that you provide context to these debates. You're like, hmm, that's not really what happened, or maybe you should look at this. And here are some resources for you to consider as you navigate like the panoply of messy ideas and broken problems that need fixing. And so I think there's a really interesting way forward for media orgs there. And who knows, maybe that'll be the business model that gets us out of the cash problem. We'll see. We'll see. Um, only if you could do programmatic advertising. Uh, but uh, but um, but so so one of the good uh, one of the really interesting threads in the comments that we're getting is along these lines. So I think a, a number of our listeners are saying, okay, like I get it. Like there needs to be some kind of thing that makes this institution authoritative and trustworthy. It's not an idea of objectivity that is effectively failing the test of time and history mm -hmm. and present. But what are what are some of the what are some of like the contours of the ethics that should guide institutions? So I mean, you're sort of hitting on so there's clearly something about transparency, something about how you engage your audience around context. Do you have some ideas about at least the elements of a kind of a, a new positive ethics uh, for for journalism and information gathering and reporting? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I don't, I don't have the unified vision yet, although I'm working on it. Next time, next time I'm on your show. Yeah, exactly. We'll next that. week. Yeah. <laughs> the <A> next unified <laughs> vision. <laughs> Tomorrow. Um, but I do think that uh, transparency in, a, in a, like a, a real lived and deep way is important, right? So it's not just like, hey, uh, I'm putting up for you how we, show, we, we showed our work. This is how we did it. You download it, like figure it out yourself. That's a good first step. But then there is an element of outreach and reaching out to communities to say, does this, does, does this make sense to you? What else would you have wanted to know? Can I listen to you, right? Like cultivating this ethos of listening, I think is a really important bedrock part of trust building. A lot, when you hear a lot of the like sort of, I hate the media, the media doesn't listen to me, they ignore me, I don't exist, I don't see myself reflected in it. And for a wide cross section of the population, that is accurate. Like yeah. that is true and media should just own that. But then the thing is affirmatively, what do you do, yeah. right? Um, and how you do that and how institutions in a time of like, you know, tight wallets can actually do that is tricky, is tricky. But I think it's gonna be an important part of the way forward because it, you just, the idea of trust afforded to you by reputation and gatekeeping quality seems not around the corner. That existed before, it was convenient. It doesn't seem like it's gonna exist in the future. So it's it's a it's the tr how do you build trust in institutions is a much larger question our society is facing and i think you have to start in these much smaller interactions yeah the, you know, there's a big insight there too i think which is that you know like these institutions are that are now dying <laughs> are effectively the, you know they're the conceptually and and actually are the legacy of the Enlightenment. And it is true that the Enlightenment makes an intrinsic argument for why you should, what, what constitutes reason, but it also makes an instrumental argument, right? Like mm -hmm. that this delivers a better society. It delivers more dignity to you. And I, that's a great point. If, if, if an audience is telling you, I don't, this, this is not a dignified experience for me, that's their truth. You know, you can't, yeah. you can't just hide behind, to your point, the institutional. I think it's a, that, that point of disconnection, I think, is really underattended in these, in these debates. Yeah. So one, one thing I don't want to leave without talking a bit about is, so we've, you know, if we've now, if we're sort of been talking about kind of the high-minded principle level issues, some of the mechanics of doing this kind of news gathering are different. And I know the markup is really at the forefront of mechanically what press freedom looks like. Again, you know, let's counterpose it with, uh, you know, you know we, did the, we did the post, so now spotlight. You know, that I think a lot of people think news gathering is like, can I get behind this wall? You know, can I interview mm -hmm. this person? Can I see the secret records? 
And understanding how some of these digitally mediated systems are shaping society and behavior requires a very different set of techniques and raises different kinds of legal issues. So can you just tell us a bit about, um, about those issues? Like mechanically, what do you need to be able to do to report and how are those press freedom challenges legally different than some of the ones we've faced in the past? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the importance of the news gathering that you just described is that, you know, if, if the press has entrusted with telling the truth about society, then they should be able to gather the news to do that too, right? And so we've had a jurisprudence that says, you can walk into a grocery store and you can say, well, the grocery store is selling some real raw meat, or you, you know, you can report on these things. And there are, of course, limitations and boundaries of how we balance, you know, public and private and property rights and all of that. We, we should have struck that balance in the physical realm. But given that the realm of the internet controls so much of what happens in the physical realm, or at least the idea of, of creating that stark division no longer makes sense, especially these days. Um, there is a step, you know, how do you um, go on a place like Amazon and say, is the marketplace selling what it should be? Uh, when they say we don't sell banned items, how do you check that? Now, one way you could is that you could just click for every single thing that Amazon sells, but of yeah. course at a place of that scale, because when we talk about understanding the internet, we are talking about understanding the scale of huge actors, right? Huge conveners, huge marketplaces. That sort of, you know, click by click approach is, gonna, is not gonna work, right? It's gonna be like 20 years until you get the story. So the ways of automating that observation, the observation of what's public, is done by methods like data scraping, for example, right? And so a, def a method like data scraping, which basically is an automated collection, automated observation at a very fast speed, it's like 10,000 people looking at a website at a, at a moment rather than one by one, that is something that can just, for example, a terms of service of a website just be like, mm, no scraping, not allowed. Now, what that means in practice is that's like a grocery store saying, no journalists allowed if you're going to say mean stuff about us, right? The way it plays out is actually a restriction on news gathering. And that's why just last week we filed an uh, amicus brief in the Supreme Court in a Computer Fraud and Abuse Act case because the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, one flawed interpretation of it is that it cedes quite a lot of power under the terms of service of a website to say pretty much anything you want. And if you violate the terms of service under the flawed theory, uh, you can go to jail or you know, be subject to hefty fines. We're like, that's kind of a problem. So what we're trying to do to wrap it up is, uh, is the, the affordance is given to news gathering into the physical realm, ensuring that they are carried forward onto the digital realm and not overshadowed by um, data privacy laws that are important in one dimension, but weren't ever meant to to reflect on news gathering and aren't you know, hindered by trade secrets laws or a variety of other commercial interests, which powerful actors can deploy to their liking, it should not, that should not snuff out investigative journalism. And so we're sort of carrying the torch to be like, no, 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 these methods matter. We're glad you know they matter. Now you have to affirmatively protect them. So it's, um, it's a fun road. It's a fun legal road. Do you, I mean, to what extent should this be part of a part of a regulatory agenda. I mean, I, you know, for sort of for two reasons. I mean, one, one is, you know, look, the beginning of pro progressivism is giving the government the ability to look at what's going on in the meatpacking industry. Now that's to understand mm -hmm. where contaminated mm -hmm. meat is, but it's to your point, it's like, it's basically information gathering. It's that we need information in order to make, in order to make decisions. But then also like, you know, it just strikes me like most of the terms of service reflect that we just don't have an affirmative view about what our relationship to these services yeah. is like, I'm pretty sure, you know, I cannot use iTunes to build a nuclear biological or chemical weapon. Like the fact that that's in the terms of service suggests <laughs> like we don't even really have a basic understanding of like what this relationship is. And so, right. um, yeah, you know, I, this is the music I listen to when I build the, you know, when I build the so, so what do you, I mean, uh, you guys are going to fight this in court, but do we do, does, does there's this, this is in a moment where we're thinking about what our affirmative regulatory apparatus should be around these companies. Does this the kind of thing that should be included in your view? Yeah, absolutely. We don't yet have a compact with these powerful actors. And here's the thing, like in, in our old conception of democratic politics, we're like, well, the state is the largest actor. Um, there is, you know, sort of the morality of consent when it comes to our interaction with the government as a powerful actor that shapes our life. And so we created, through, especially through the rise of the administrative state, a variety of ways that we're like, well, you're really big and you control our life. So I can file a Freedom of Information Act request and learn more about you. I have, I have sort of 
the nature of representative politics that gives me inroads into this institution. We have no parallel structure when it comes to these big technology companies who exert as much, if not more power over our lives than the state can, right? Uh, in certain realms. Um, and so because there is no parallel infrastructure there of transparency and even just the compact of obligations, aside from, okay, don't use it if you don't want some sort of thin capitalist logic to it, we need something more robust. And I think that is the most exciting thing that's on the horizon in the years to come. I think it's happening. We're watching it happen. And it's, um, it's a really exciting project. Well, good. We, we should end on excitement, uh, given, what we've been, given what we've been talking about, <laughs> uh, given what we've talked about today. Uh, for, uh, for anyone interested in, in, in hearing more from Nabiha, you can follow her on Twitter, uh, at Nabiha Syed. Uh, you can read about what she's working on in her letter from the president at themarkup.org. Uh, as always, we'll send all of this to you after uh, the show. Uh, Nabiha, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. This was so much fun. All right, everyone, before we go, I want to tell you uh, more about what's coming up on Vision. Uh, uh, next week on July 23rd, uh, we'll be uh, joined by Eugene Volokh. Uh, he's a First Amendment law professor uh, at UCLA, and I think it's safe to say we'll give a somewhat different view uh, than, than we've been hearing in recent weeks. Um, on July 30th, we'll be hosting Alondra Nelson, who's the president of the Social Science Research Council and a, a really important scholar uh, thinking about issues of sort of race, society, and technology. Uh, and then on August 6th, we're going to be hosting uh, Lulu Garcia Navarro, who's the weekend host uh, of, uh, or the Sunday host, excuse me, of Weekend Edition on NPR. Extraordinarily excited about those episodes. Uh, as a reminder, this uh, episode will be available on the website. You can see this episode in any episode on demand at kf.org slash vision. Email us at vision at kf.org or visit us on Instagram at vision.kf. Please take the survey. That's only two questions on your screen right now. And as always, we will end the show to the sounds of Miami songwriter Nick County. You can check out his music on Spotify. Until next week, everyone, thanks and stay safe.